good afternoon. I'm Rodney Martinez, WMO representative for North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And I will moderate this first part of, of the session. First of all, uh, I would like to remind you that the, we have interpretation available for this session. And welcome all to this learning session on lining and wildfires organized by the World Meteorological Organization, the Issue-Based Coalition on Climate Change and Resilience, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. This session is intended to provide a concise but relevant information about the wildfires and our lining information systems in the Americas and the Caribbean. For that, we have the great opportunity to learn from distinguished experts from the region with long and valuable practical experience in these fields. This session particularly aims to review lessons learned on wildfire monitoring, prediction, and response in the Americas, review the region progress and challenges in lining detection and prediction, identify best practices for integrating lining and wildfire data systems, uh, improve current risk management approaches for these hazards, and share with all of you the uh, findings of the issue-based coalition uh, regarding to wildfire resilience. This session will be divided into segments. The first one will be de dedicated to wildfires with four presentations, followed by a period of questions and answers. You can make the questions uh, speaking or uh, writing them in the chat. And the second segment will be online with three presentations followed by a period of questions and answers. Each speaker will have eight minutes for their presentation. And I kind of request to all the, the speakers to keep this time for your interventions and let the space in the, in the end of the session for an open discussion on cooperation and coordination aspects. Many thanks to the speakers who accepted to share their vast experience with us today. I would like to introduce now to our first speaker, Dr. Peter Van Gerup, a regional forestry officer of Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Peter has been working in the field of development cooperation after the last 30 years. He has coordinated projects on forestry education and wildfires in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And over the last five years, he has been working in the sub-regional office of FAO in Panama and lately in Santiago de Chile, where he has been coordinating activities on biodiversity and forest management, including fire management. He will present the latest report on the issue based coalition of climate change and resilience on wildfires in Latin America and the Caribbean. Peter, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rodney. I will. Uh, good day or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, I would like to present to you how different agencies of the United Nations uh, try to better coordinate. Uh, their activities in uh, fire management or the uh, wildfires in general by developing a common frame for our activities. Um, I would briefly like to present to you a, a short introduction, uh, then talk about some of the results we had, which have to deal with a short outlook on wildfires in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, a Sunday based approach to integrated fire management, uh, something about the capacity of the UN agencies in this field, uh, and finally some short conclusions. Um, the regional uh, uh, Carrillo Collaborative uh, Platform, or RCP, for Latin America and the Caribbean unites all United Nations entities working on development in the region. The overall objective is to provide a light and agile United Nations development system that is demand-driven and results-oriented to ensure coordination, collaboration, and the best use of United Nations expertise and assets at the regional level to support member states. Um, the issue-based um, the issue-based coalition on climate change and resilience, which is part of this uh, platform, uh, seeks to enable UN agencies to work together to support a coherent and aligned implementation of the global agendas, in particular the 2030 Agenda, the UNFCCC, including the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030. So I'm going to click now. 
Uh, finally, this uh, issue-based coalition decided to form a task force uh, on wildfires to articulate a more coherent approach uh, between UN agencies and for the UN country teams in, in, in the region. Uh, the results which we have seen was a short outlook on wildfires in Latin America, something about the trends and the impact for the group of regional directors and the UN country teams. To come up with a common interagency approach on wildfires and to identify UN assets available at the regional and country levels in the region. Regarding a short outlook, if you look at the uh, data or analyzing the data from the Joint Research Center Global Wildfire Information System, we see from 2009 till 2019. Uh, an average of 33 million of hectares in Latin America and the Caribbean affected by wildfires, with a peak in 2019 of over 56,000 million of hectares, a thousand hectares, sorry, uh, and between 2009 and 2018, uh, the lowest of less than 224 million hectares. It's not in this, let's say, 10 years. It's very difficult to see a clear trend nor for the areas affected, nor the number of fires. Um, based on the Sunday outcome of the, the task force proposed a 5R approach, an integrated approach on fire management that, that places greater emphasis on addressing the underlying causes and seeks long-term sustainable solutions that incorporate five essential elements, the five Rs. These elements are the same as the globally adapted character characterization of the Sendai framework for disaster risk production used in dealing with disasters and their management. Those five R's are, uh, first of all, the, the importance of review, analysis of the fire issue and identifications of possibilities for positive change. The second one is the risk production. Prevention, focusing resources on the underlying causes of fire. Third one is readiness, preparing for, for fight, uh, to fight fires, building the capacities which are needed for that. Fourth R is response. Uh, in the case of fires taking place, taking action, ensuring appropriate responses to unwanted or damaging fires. And finally, the recovery, recovery which might exist of three different parts, related to community welfare, repairing infrastructure, and restoration of fire damaged landscapes. I would like to mention that of crucial importance is the need for resources to be directed to support fire data collection and analysis that improves the understanding of fire causes, which identifies existing management practices that encourage harmful fires and promote management systems that take advantage of well-established fire use. Analysis in fire-prone areas needs to start before a fire start, uh, begins. Better prevention or risk reduction can only be based on a better understanding of the fire. So really that first, the first R on review is extremely important. Now, what can we say about UN agency capacity or expertise in the region? We have seen uh, some agencies which have specific expertise or experience in the region dealing with wildfire management in uh, some of those, uh, the different five R's which were mentioned. And we also see some agencies with relevant non-specific expertise or experience in the region. Here we can think about specific humanitarian uh, actions, which uh, uh, has, have to be taken as soon as uh, people are affected by fires. And by means of conclusion, uh, we think that the integrated fire management, which integrates science and fire management approaches with socioeconomic elements at multiple levels for the planning and implementation, of a balanced approach to managing fires is crucial. Such a realistic uh, approach addresses fire issues that considers biological, environmental, cultural, social, economic, and political interactions. And it's very important that this integrated fire management puts more emphasis on addressing the underlying causes and seek long-term sustainable solutions that will incorporate those five essential elements, the five R's that I called them before. Here I'm ending my presentation, and I hope it will be of use for the following presentation.
thank you very much, uh, Peter, for your presentation. And uh, I would like to invite to Mr. Dennis Dudley, manager of the Canadian Line in Detection Network uh, from the Meteorological Service of Canada. He has uh, more than 30, 30 years of experience with ECCC, this is Environment and Climate Change Canada, working primarily in the areas of operational meteorology, user engagement, and project leadership. Dennis has been the manager of the Canadian Lightning Detection Network since the 2008, and he's based in British Columbia, one of the most active wildfire areas in Canada. His community was devastated in 2003, Okanagan Mountain Park fire that destroyed over 200 homes and businesses. Since that time, Dennis has been working with provincial and territorial agencies to better understand their needs and develop products and services that reduce the impact of wildfires and other weather-related hazards in British Columbia and across Canada. He will present lessons learned of multi-hazard event in Western Canada. Dennis, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Dennis Dudley, and I'll be presenting on lessons learned from a multi-hazard event in Canada. The juxtaposition of several hazards brought devastating impacts to Canadians living on the West Coast this past summer. The size of the disaster overwhelmed responding agencies as well as the resources of the Weather Service in Canada. The main takeaway is the need to communicate the level of risk more effectively with the public and with our partners. British Columbia and the Yukon are located along Canada's west coast. This is where several hazards culminated in July and August, specifically drought, heat, wildfire, poor air quality, and we'll look at each of these briefly uh, over the next uh, few minutes. Here's the timeline of the interconnected hazards. A dry winter and dry spring led to drought conditions across Western Canada. Extreme heat led to rapid snowmelt, causing historic flooding in the Yukon and set the stage for prime wildfire conditions in British Columbia. These wildfires gave rise to smoke and poor air quality into September, and both British Columbia and the Yukon declared states of emergency, with BC dealing with four emergencies at the same time, plus the overlay of the surging Delta variant. This image from Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada shows the extent of the drought in July causing numerous impacts, one of which was increased risk of intense wildfire caused by the buildup of fuel, particularly in southern BC. The last week of June, first week of July, saw a uh, historic heat wave sweep across southern British Columbia. This was the most deadly weather event in Canadian history, causing nearly 600 heat-related deaths over an eight-day period. The graphic on the left shows the mortality across the province with the regions in the southwest corner hardest hit. The graphic on the right shows the time series of temperature on the top in blue and the mortality rate on the bottom. The orange and red squares represent the excess heat-related mortality above normal baseline. The mortality was evident in all ages except children. Many victims were found in private residence without air conditioning. Lack of green spaces, living alone, and lower incomes were associated factors. In terms of extreme temperatures, climatologists are calling this a 1 in 500 to a 1 in 1,000 year event. Nearly 1,500 temperature records were broken, but the most dramatic evidence of the impact of the heat occurred in Lytton, BC. It broke the Canadian all-time record high three days in a row. And then on the fourth day, unfortunately, the town was destroyed by a wildfire. The graphic on the left shows nearly 500 wildfires burning by early August, half of which were out of control. The majority of the interface fires were located in southern British Columbia, where communities are nestled within a forest landscape. Images like the one on the right filled television screens on a nightly basis. This fire shut down a major highway in August. Lightning causes approximately 50% of all wildfires in BC. This graphic is a time series showing daily lightning activity across British Columbia from May to October. The Meteorological Service of Canada owns and operates a national lightning detection network that provides forecasters and partners with real-time lightning information across Canada. The graphic illustrates that most of the lightning occurred 
on a half a dozen days separated by relative calm. These handful of days are the most critical because they are associated with the majority of impacts of, from wildfires. Our biggest structural losses and impacts and evacuations occurred on these particular days. In addition to structural losses, wildfires had tremendous impacts on transportation sector, on the economy, closing down highways and damaging rail lines. And from this image from NASA, we can see the spread of wildfire smoke causing some of the worst air quality in the world. In Canada, response to emergencies such as wildfires and flooding are the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories. Environment Canada's weather service issues heat warnings and provides support to responding agencies. But in this situation, our staff became overwhelmed by the needs and by all of the requests for service. We issued over 400 heat warnings and responded to hundreds of media interviews and social media posts. Communication with our partners became increasingly difficult as they were too were also overwhelmed by the magnitude of the multi-hazard event. While heat warnings were issued two days in advance, it's not clear that they were able to convey the level of risk in a way that allowed the public and responding agencies to effectively prepare for these unprecedented series of events. For example, on the left is our first heat warning issued by Environment and Climate Change Canada. It was issued two days before the onset of, of heat mortality. I would like you to draw your attention to just some of the language in the bulletin. Dangerous heat wave affecting British Columbia, 27 to 37 degrees, ridge of high pressure. Now, one might ask, danger to whom? And 29 to 37 degrees, how rare are those temperatures? And what does it mean to me? Am I at risk? And what can I do? So a more powerful narrative would describe the magnitude of the risk by putting the event in historical context and describe impacts from previous heat waves. For example, this will be an unprecedented heat wave with potential to cause significant loss of life. The last major heat wave to hit this region occurred 10 years ago and caused over 200 heat-related deaths. This event will be hotter than the previous event with record-breaking temperatures expected over a number of days. All ages are at risk, particularly the elderly and those living alone without air conditioning. Areas with minimal green space and residents without air conditioning are particularly at risk. Clear action statements would follow, and with the help of our provincial partners and the social and behavioral scientists, we would be able to target the most vulnerable and message with messaging that influences protective action. This would better communicate the magnitude of the risk and is why we're moving toward an impact-based approach in the weather service. Here's an example of an experimental product we are providing to our response or responding agencies. It's a color tiered risk-based graphic that indicates the level of risk and impacts to be expected. This was issued three days before heat impacts began. And in this case, while our product drew attention to a series of impacts, we underestimated the magnitude of the risk. We are collaborating with our international partners to accelerate our learning and the use of best practices in this regard. In terms of lessons learned, forecasts and warnings did not successfully convey the extremity of the risk. Tiered approaches with impact-based information will provide more relevant action-oriented information. It would be necessary to collaborate with our partners who have taken a similar path and experienced similar outcomes elsewhere. Communication with partners became more challenging as the scope of the disaster increased. Strategic planning well in advance for multi-hazard events is critical. Co-creating simulations, tabletop exercises could be very useful exercises. And finally, our own staffing levels in the weather service and approaches for responding to surge events like these needs to be reviewed and, and bolstered. In summary, a devastating impact to life and property and economy occurred in, in a multi-hazard event in Western Canada this past summer. In collaboration with our partners, the Meteorological Service of Canada is modernizing its services in order to respond to unprecedented weather driven by climate change. And finally, effective risk communication targeted to vulnerable are necessary to reduce the size of future disasters. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we, 
it, the presentation has several key messages for the audience and the purpose of this of, of the session. Thank you. I would like to invite now to Mr. Head A. Hockenberry, Five Weather Program Manager of the National Weather Service of USA. He started working for the National Weather Service in Billings, Montana in 90, 1995. He was transferred to Eureka in California in late 1996, where he became the Marine Forecasting Focal Point. After Eureka, he moved to Blacksburg, Virginia, where he had the opportunity to become a fire weather incident meteorologist. And he served as an incident meteorologist during the 2000 fire season in Nevada, Montana, and Virginia. In 2001, he became the Assistant National Fire Weather Program Manager for the Bureau of of Land Management and National Interagency Fire Center. In May of 2005, he became the National Weather Service Fire Weather Program Manager. He will present the innovations on operational information to support wildfire management and the lessons learned. Ed, a welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'll share my screen here. Excellent. Well, thank you. Those last two presentations were wonderful. Uh, they tie very well within the information I'm going to present today on operational supply, fire support and the lessons we've learned recently and, and some of the gaps. So um, basically what I'm going to go over with is our history, the fire life cycle, which very much matches Peter's five R's that you saw on the first presentation. Uh, we didn't quite get to the 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 brilliance i'd say of the alliteration to to, to drive home things but uh the products and services I'll, I'll segue into that finally the gaps that we have identified from experiences over the past decade at least uh our history within the weather service dates back about 100 years uh we had uh very many landmark events in order to prompt our being requested to provide these services for fire management. Uh, our current most effective system to respond to fires uh, out of the National Weather Service uh, comes from the Incident Command System, which was evolved in the California area in the 70s. So um, it dates back to then, but these are two really cool pictures that you're seeing up on the screen. Uh, that's a Weather Bureau uh, employee on horseback. And uh, also, uh, we used to drive out and have our own vehicles. So we don't do that now. We just fly and rent vehicles now. But uh, we do have uh, a lot of um, history, though. And leading up to today, there is a ton of legislation within the United States Congress right now focusing on fire weather and identifying the needs that we have to build upon lessons learned from these past. I would classify them as devastating for fire seasons. All right, so this is a graphic that kind of outlines how we respond, uh, what our area responsibility and illustrates the complexity of the partners that we have. Fire is very what we call ground up. Uh, the local units drive the eventual requests for management. They identify the complexity of the situation. Uh, so we tend to put local needs uh, at that elevated status rather than top-down management approaches. So that is a key area that we have uh, within our 123 weather forecast offices uh, in the United States, Alaska, and Pacific region, including Guam. Uh, we have to make sure that our warnings are tailored to the local fuels, to the local weather uh, and fire behavior, and to the climate regimes that they're in, and also the specific weather events. Uh, a 25% relative humidity in Florida is completely different in California. So we do have to build our products and services based on local first to, to geographic area and finally up to all these partners at the national level. Uh, this is a graphic that we've used to brief our congressional um, liaisons and members of Congress to illustrate our involvement starting at the top with pre-ignition, working its way clockwise. And again, it, it very much matches Peter's five R's. Uh, but we're identifying the stages as pre-ignition, detection, forecasting, post-fire, and monitoring. And I'll go through each of these and what we do. 
In the pre-ignition and analysis stage, uh, it all depends on fuels and fire potential outlooks that we do in concert uh, and led by the fire agencies, actually. Uh, they're predictive services units. They do put out the um, continental U.S., Alaska, uh, and Hawaii uh, fire outlooks uh, for the monthly and seasonal timeframes. So as we move into these seasons, um, we do have to do those fuels and potential analysis to get an idea of where resources, especially, this does have a resource focus uh, and not necessarily a weather climate, but where we expect out of area resources to be requested uh, that exceed local capacity. Detection of fires is huge with the new GOES capabilities uh, JPSS for uh, the polar orbiting, again, higher resolution, but lower frequency versus the GOES, uh, slightly lower re resolution, but uh, continual monitoring, we're able to get down to a 30-second uh, in high scan refresh rate on what the GOES can do in terms of detection of hot spots and fire radiative power. So we are starting to use this to inform our warning decisions. Uh, and our spot forecast decisions and where the fires are burning the hottest. And the fire agencies also have access to this and they can assess for themselves in concert with conventional ground-based spots of, uh, or spotting networks that allow uh, local units to respond to smaller fires to keep them small. In the now casting and forecasting stage, uh, our high resolution rapid refresh smoke and weather models assist us greatly. Um, those are operational now, including the smoke, uh, I, I believe became operational in December of 2020. Um, so we're focusing on that air quality aspect too. And the graphic on the right, that's, that's me in Georgia uh, doing a briefing. We do provide on-site weather services called incident meteorolo meteorologists. Uh, there's about 90 to 100 of us at any given point, and we're looking to expand those numbers coming up pretty soon. But we do provide an average of 140 IMET missions. And uh, you heard Dennis's presentation of what happened in Western Canada. Obviously, that extends down into the Western US with the unprecedented heat dome that we saw. Uh, with the lightning outbreaks that we have, uh, very much like BC, about 50% of our fires are lightning. Um, and this year, we've been out so far 216 times, which exceeds our 140 average greatly. We set a record this year for moving from a weather forecast office out to the actual frontline incident command posts at two weeks at a time where we deliver forecasts and localized warnings. Post-fire recovery, obviously, is critical for flooding. Uh, we're facing that right now with all the wet, uh, wet weather moving in across the West Coast here. Uh, we do work directly uh, through our hydrology program with burned area recovery, uh, their teams. And uh, obviously, our partners at, at NESDIS help monitor that as well through satellite detection and GOES. Long-term monitoring. Obviously, the climate connections to fire and changing fire regimes are an area of emphasis where we need more information, more effective communication to both fire management and the public of how things are evolving toward the future. Uh, Long-term fuels assessment, uh, the graphic on the left is kind of the, the frequency or return of fire that, that typically happens. And um, so monitoring how long it's been since an area has burned and gives you a sense of how close you are to, to getting another event. Let's just say that. So the gaps we're actively trying to mitigate through uh, our strategic planning, our goals, our milestones, and the legislation that's being proposed is to uh, better connect detection to warning products, um, coupling the atmosphere with fire behavior. Uh, we don't really have a nationalized fire behavior spread model. Uh, there are universities actively working on that as we speak. I think that's the wave of the future, including our artificial intelligence to help connect detections to the fire behavior. Uh, test beds to, to, uh, to explore the ideas, the good ideas that are out there. And uh, a lot of the bottom ones have to do with observations and observations of the, of the boundary layer. So 
those are the gaps that were identified and what we are working on right now. And with that, I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Heath. Uh, I think uh, these three first presentations have provided a lot of context of what we wanted to share in this session with all the audience in the Americas, all the people who's working in, in different levels in the interaction and the management on wildfires. And of course, the experience of, uh, of, uh, of Canada and US is very important to learn. Uh, this year and the previous year has been a uh, has been characterized by the records that we have in terms of extremes and wildfire is no, is no exception. So we are all learning. But of course, the purpose of this session is also to share this knowledge and these, these challenges with all, all the countries in the region and the people who has to, to, to deal with, um, with all these, uh, these hazards uh, despite the technical and, and, and sometimes uh, institutional limitations in terms of governance, uh, legal frameworks, et cetera. So if it's all that we have listened now in this session is very useful to share with all the audience. Thank you very much. I would like to invite to Dr. Radenko Ablovic, uh, who is a numerical weather prediction development section chief at the Canadian Meteorological Center. He comes from Environment and Climate Change Canada, where he's currently the, the the chief of, of the numerical weather prediction development section, as, as I said, he has also been in charge of the air quality policy issue response and operational analysis and prognosis teams and CMC. Uh, Rodenko has been involved in the air quality domain for more than 15 years, particularly in the operational wildfire related pollution modeling. Since 2019, he has been actively involved in the organization of the North American WMO Vegetation Fire and Smoke Pollution Warning Advisory and Assessment System, currently hosted by the ECCC. And in recent years, he has also participated and supported various WMO Global Atmosphere Watch Program initiatives. Uh, he will present the lesson learned on wildfire pollution, forecasting, and related collaborative initiatives in North America. Rodenko, welcome. The floor is, is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. So I'll talk uh, about lessons learned on wildfire pollution forecasting and related collaborative initiatives in North America. We all know to what extent wildfires are affecting uh, human lives, our economy, and also human health. And if you take a look into recorded wildfires uh, over the last few decades in North America, we can see that there is an increasing trend uh, of frequency and uh, of those wildfires, and at the same time, those wildfires are more extreme. And in the light of uh, climate change projection, we can expect that those wildfires will be even more present and more extreme. So it is the common summertime event in North America, and uh, as I mentioned, is uh, has a, a significant impact on on our economy, human health, and human lives. So this is the reason why there was an emerging need to include wildfire emissions in our national uh, air quality uh, capability. So our system has evolved over, let's say, 10 years, uh, uh, we are use and we were using today different systems, dispersion systems, with systems with online chemistry, and we made significant progress in providing accurate and climate spoke prediction. However, there are always some issues uh, and space for improvement, especially uh, related to the uh, wildfire emission estimates and uh, why there was a need to include this in our air quality national program, because wildfires are the predominant source of the pollution during summertime. In the western parts of states and Canada, this is the principal source of PM2.5 uh, fine particle uh, matter pollution uh, in both countries, states, the United States and in Canada. So uh, here we can see uh, to what extent on, on, on a continental level we are affected uh, by pollution per wildfires for two years, for two summer times, 2020 on the left-hand side, 2021. This provides uh, an information about wildfire emission contribution to the total surface PM2.5 concentrations. And we can see, and this is the average over five to four 
five, four or five uh, months period of time. And we can see that in western parts of states last year, we have regions that were affected by about 20, 30, even about 40 micron per meter cube. So over period of four or five months. If you take a look into a shorter period of time, we are dealing really with extreme uh, pollution from wildfires. Uh, over the last uh, summer uh, time, we can see that those hotspots were more uh, dispersed over North America with some major hotspots even in Ontario, in Manitoba, and Canada. But if you take a look uh, as a continent as a whole, we can clearly see that we were almost all affected by pollution uh, uh, generated by uh, wildfires. So since the beginning, there are some, some lessons learned about air quality for I can think. Uh, the, the, the principal need for including it into our uh, national capability is, uh, as I mentioned previously, and it was mentioned by Dennis and the others, uh, that pollution generated by wildfires are the most important source of uh, uh, air quality pollution uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a national level, but especially in the Western parts of states and Canada. Uh, we, uh, in the beginning, uh, our objective was to include this in our operational air quality forecasting capability, but since then, the uh, request uh, uh, and elaborating the other opportunities like uh, different kind of derived products, how visibility is reduced, what is the feedback on the meteorology, uh, surface level objective analysis product uh, uh, is also something we, we have been working on, but the most challenging thing we are dealing with forecasting the uh, uh, pollution from wildfires are detection of hotspots and estimate, uh, estimating uh, uh, associated uh, wildfire emissions. Sometimes those hotspots are, are uh, hidden by uh, cloud cover, or even if you detect these hotspots, what is the size of the hotspots, how it will evolve over time in the upcoming two, three days, uh, if we take it to climatology. So, there are always some issues, but however, we uh, made a significant progress over the last 10 years, and our uh, systems are more and more uh, uh, solid in forecasting uh, associated pollution. Uh, and as mentioned by my previous uh, colleagues, we need regional and inter international cooperation on this topic. This is the only way how we can improve and help each other in providing uh, uh, products that are tailored to users' need. needs. Uh, there also, uh, as I mentioned, a need for the, the derived products from uh, wildfire forecasting. One of them is to uh, to be able to uh, uh, forecast the visibility reduction due to the uh, wildfire pollution. The, uh, airports in Canada need that because it affects aviation, it affects the other sectors. So that's why we did on our end at Environmental Climate Change Canada. We made some efforts. We are also forecasting in experimental mode visibility reduction due to wildfires. There is also surface level objective analysis. So we are able to provide information over North America. What is the current state when it comes to the pollution uh, coming from wildfires? So we are taking our uh, air quality forecast and we are, if I can say, correct it with the near real time observation. So we have a clear picture about the current situation across across the continent. And it's very useful for operational forecasters and also for different kinds of health impact studies. So uh, we are not the only region in the world that are affected by wildfires. Uh, that's why in 2018, WMO has published a report number 235, where they suggested the creation of a regional WMO center, uh, so regional vegetation, fire, and smoke pollution warning and advisory center that will put together uh, uh, countries in the region and make them uh, work together on providing uh, uh, better services to, to the public. So. The first center was created year after in 2019 uh, for Southeastern Asia and it's hosted by Singapore. The second one was created last year in Montreal, Canada, hosted by Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, it was done in collaboration with our regional partners and we started with product dissemination last year. So our first way is, is to collect what's available in North America and then let's work together to, uh, to upgrade those products and to provide better services uh, across, across the continent. So here's the scope of this international collaboration. What the WMO suggests is to uh, work and provide information about the potential risk for wildfires. So short-term risk of, for the upcoming days, upcoming uh, season, so seasonal, exceptional forecast, climate anomalies, temperature precipitation anomalies, any indication that, uh, that can be used to have uh, uh, an idea about uh, wildfire potential over the upcoming months, even the, the, the upcoming uh, year. Uh, then uh, to provide information about the current situation when it comes to wildfires, where are the hotspots, where are the wildfires, what is the current uh, uh, pollution observed 
uh, across the continent. Then to provide information about uh, uh, forecasting those wildfires, put together multimodal ensemble forecast uh, and uh, related statistics. And it's, uh, it, it should also serve as a platform for potential research projects that we can work together on uh, uh, preparing better tools and products uh, for our potential users. The structure of this collaboration is like federation structure with regional nodes. So as I mentioned, there are two regional nodes right now. So far, uh, one in uh, Southeastern Asia, the second one in North America, and there's a plan to, to, uh, to build uh, the other uh, centers across, across the world. So last summer, we created six uh, working groups uh, attached to these WMO initiatives. Uh, there is a working group that we work on multimodal ensemble forecast, working group uh, in charge of verifications, working group in charge of emissions. This is a topic uh, we, we are all excited about. Uh, it's one of the major issues in forecasting uh, uh, wildfire-related pollution. Uh, there is a working group related to the wildfire risks. So, as I explained, sub-seasonal, seasonal forecast, climate anomalies, uh, short-term fire, fire risk and danger index. So, anything that can be helpful to, to be better prepared for uh, wildfires and to take some mitigation measures. Also, we will share information about uh, the current situation. What are the observed concentration when it comes to pollution uh, that, that is generated by wildfires? How uh, information about detection, satellite images, uh, anything that can be useful. And there is also one new initiative, uh, is the Arctic Initiative. It's the extreme north of our continent, but wildfires are affecting this region with pollution advocating into Arctic Circle. But wildfire, even in the Arctic Circle, are more and more frequent. Uh, so the amount of uh, emissions injected in the Arctic Circle is, is becoming uh, important. So this is one of the, of the sectors we can be working together. There are some uh, environmental issues for the Arctic Bureau now, so I will not address uh, them right now. So in the conclusion, I can say that wildfire pollution uh, capability uh, has improved in North America. Uh, we have uh, agencies in the United States, in Mexico and Canada that are able in providing uh, timely services related to the wildfire uh, related pollution. Uh, there are many issues. I would say that the, the, the most important is the near real-time estimates of wildfire emissions. It, there are some challenges, but we can work together in improving our capability. Uh, there are also some regional initiatives uh, in North America, but there is a new one international uh, uh, this is very well aligned with our uh, needs, so it's a uh, regional center uh, uh, initialized by WMO, one regional for North America, vegetation, fire, smoke pollution, warning and advisory center. So if you're interested in joining this initiative, you can write to me, to myself, or to uh, Daniel Tong uh, from NOM. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rodenko. I think uh, uh, you mentioned very important aspects regarding to the international cooperation. For these big challenges, we really need to work together. And this is the intention of WMO with the implementation of these regional centers, promote cooperation and try to, to really optimize the responses to the more challenging uh, hazards that we have in, in the regions. And also to provide a message to South America, Central America, and the Caribbean in terms of how this could be adapted to the, their needs and this kind of centers could be implemented in other regions in the, in the Americas. Thank you very much. And I would like to open now uh, to give uh, some opportunity to the audience to uh, have uh, some questions in this first segment to our experts. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, we will try to, to, to forward these questions to the speakers. Mylene is in, uh, Cabral is interacting with the audience and she will retrieve all the questions that we could have. Well, there is a question about how do you determine the chance of recurrence of fire in an area? It's, it's an open question for our speakers. So please, if you want to respond or, or some of you uh, want to respond, will be very welcome. The, the chance of recurrence, um, I think it's just based on historical fire data. Um, I don't know the exact mechanics of the graphic. It's not my area of expertise, but uh, the, the fuels experts know the regimes. They've classified certain fire regimes. And there is a return interval of fire that's associated with those particular uh, fire danger rating areas within the United States. So. 
I don't know the mechanics, um, but the graphic that I showed in my presentation is tied to climate regimes and uh, fire danger rating areas, I believe. Thank you, Heath, for your response. Okay, I will. Uh, I think we will have some time uh, after the second segment to, to have uh, to retrieve more questions from the audience. Now, I would like to to start the second segment related to uh, uh, another particular natural hazard, which is important. It's lining. It's related to lining, and and uh, of course, we have a lot to share and to discuss about uh, lining in the context of this regional platform. So I, I really encourage to our audience to, to provide the questions, the questions you have in, in the chat or in the system that we have, and we will try to respond to them at the end of the, of the session. Now I would like to introduce to our next speaker, Dr. Arlene Lyne. Uh, she's the coordinating director of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization, the CMO. She is also the permanent representative for the British Caribbean territories with the World Meteorological Organization. CMO is a specialized agency of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, that coordinates joint activities in weather, climate, weather-related sciences in 16 English-speaking Caribbean states. Dr. Lang is a member of the WMO Executive Council and the Research Board, and she's the lead author of an introduction to tropical meteorology a peer-reviewed online textbook that is used globally. She's also a co-author of the editorial committee member of an editorial committee member of the award-winning book Meteorology of Tropical West Africa, the Forecasters Handbook. She will present today a presentation is toward, towards improved lighting detection, awareness, and safety in the Caribbean. Unfortunately, uh, because uh, a problem in, in, in her flight. Uh, she could make it to, be, uh, to make this presentation uh, uh, online, but she provided a recording of the presentation that was intended to, to be shown today. So uh, uh, I would like to request um, to present the video sent by Dr. Uh, Dr. Lai. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Arlene Lyne. I'm the coordinating director of the Caribbean Meteorological Organization Headquarters Unit. And I'm going to be speaking today on efforts to improve lightning detection awareness and safety in the Caribbean. And I'd like to say thank you to the WMO for inviting me to join. Lightning is, of course, the most common weather hazard that most people in the world will encounter, and some on a daily basis. With more than 4,000 deaths per year, and um, this is from studies of 24 countries, but global estimates actually exceed that in terms of numbers of deaths annually. So lightning risk management really is disaster risk management because of the threat to lives and well-being of large populations of people and livestock and the persistence of the hazards in certain regions. Lightning peaks in the tropics where we have the numbers of least developed countries whose economies are in danger of suffering property loss from lightning fires, damage to electrical and electronic systems. In this modern computer age, this is an issue, especially with regard to downtime when you have service outages and data loss and power quality problems. Lightning therefore can actually not only create a disaster, but hinder sustainable development. And on the right, we have the example from Barbados in June of this year, when a large thunderstorm system developed very rapidly and produced within a few hours the same amount of lightning that had been observed in total over the previous four to five years. Where do we get lightning activity having its most impact? Outdoor sports is one of those areas. And in recent years, El Salvador suffered when they lost their um, Olympic hopeful on the beach. Football, soccer is another area where players are in danger from being outdoors. And tourism on a zip line. In Jamaica, we had some tourists being injured. In aviation, international aviation was affected when a trough extended from Hurricane Irma caused a lightning strike on the air traffic control center in Kingston, Jamaica. And not only were flights grounded on the compound, but also flights traversing the area were affected. 
agriculture is one of the areas that has major impact with um, this example from my own parish in Jamaica where two persons were killed last year while they were picking avocados in a community that has been affected by lightning. Lightning wildfires are an issue as well as that with regard to households being affected. Boating and fishing is another area of um, lightning safety danger with insurance losses that have been increasing over the years, actually tripling in the last 15 years and accounting for about 10% or more of losses that are recorded according to Yachting World in August of last year. The private sector is increasingly concerned because of the impact on business continuity. And the example here actually describes the office of the prime minister being affected by an outage due to lightning strike. And up in the right-hand corner, the importance of schools and students being aware. This is from my high school in, in Jamaica, where 13 students were actually injured when they're in a meeting in a classroom. So they weren't even outdoors. Buildings and infrastructure are, of course, um, exposed when you have high buildings. And in Trinidad last year, a bolt of lightning beheaded a statue on top of a cathedral. And of course, Trinidad being a, as it is, there were lots of superstitions that ensued. So we ended up having um, a consultation with the World Met Organization, and together we agreed to host a symposium on lightning and lightning safety awareness in May of this year. And you can find further information at the two links that are shown here and one of them is an article in Meteor World. Um, we had 131 participants from 28 countries. What did we learn in the symposium? That lightning deaths and injuries are actually preventable. Not too many of the deaths and injuries are due to direct strikes. Most are actually indirect coming through the ground currents or side flashes and so we can take um, measures to protect ourselves. In the Caribbean, most deaths are occur, have occurred in Jamaica and Belize, with agriculture, fishing, football, soccer, and beach activity being primarily um, the sectors and activities. In Jamaica, this increase in casualties has been reported since 2017, which led to the Met Service hosting a workshop in 2019 with other stakeholders to build resilience to lightning hazards. And Belize has also embarked on developing a national lightning detection network. And the photos on the right, you can find more information in the symposium website, but this shows you a schematic of what parts of the body are most affected. We have um, lightning safety, culture and education having reduced the numbers of deaths in the US due to the work of the National Lightning Safety Council with their awareness campaigns, such as when thunder roars go indoors. And that, Awareness has been heightened now for the Spanish-speaking Americas because in the U.S., Latinos are most exposed because of the kinds of jobs that um, they hold. The top occupations of the Latino workforce are outdoors. There's also extension to the international lightning safety with um, groups in Africa and Asia. And now since 2020, there's been the International Lightning Safety Day on the 28th of June, which commemorates the occasion in 2011, rather tragic, when 18 students were killed and another 38 were injured by a single lightning strike at a primary school in Uganda. Lightning preparedness and protection measures can be taken with primarily with regard to safety in sports, with lightning-specific emergency actions and sets of um, commands and identification of safe locations indoors, not um, exposed. And the setting of criteria for when you would postpone an event, when you would evacuate, and when you would resume activities. And this, of course, depends on having reliable monitoring of the weather, and particularly for larger venues when more people are exposed. It's also important to widely share the best practices for property owners and builders for how to build lightning protection for their, their properties. The example shown here is what's coming out of Costa Rica, where they have set up a lightning detection network that allows them to have real-time alerts by cell phone and email. Where is the lightning exactly? It's primarily along those areas with high terrain. And actually, the global peak of lightning flash density is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. 
and the Greater Antilles and in Central America, for the Caribbean Met Organization member states, Jamaica and Belize are the peak. And the monthly mean shows that the seasonal peak is in the late summer, while the diurnal peak is in the mid to late afternoon. El Nino, the interannual variability related to sea surface temperature changes in the Pacific is a good predictor for lightning activity in the US Gulf Coast and the Northern South America. And by extension, we know that would also be the case for the Caribbean, but we need to have detailed study there. El Nino in Florida had more precipitation than normal, which is true for the Caribbean, but then it dried out in the summer. And um, in South America, they found that understanding how CAPE is transported, the convective available potential energy is transported north to south is a good predictor of lightning activity. And this will help with decision-making for disaster risk reduction. In Florida, what we found in my study with my colleague, Charlie Paxson, is that lightning was the single primary source of fires and lightning fires occupied most of the acreage burned. And you can see where that um, is in the graph here, as well as in the map. And bushfires are also a concern in Jamaica. And the Jamaican Met Service has developed a bushfire warning index and management system and shared that with the fire brigade. So I'd like to conclude by saying we are advocating for lightning safety to be a part of the disaster risk reduction framework. And we're also proposing um, to form an ad hoc regional working group on lightning and linking that with the International Lightning Safety and Protection Group, and that this needs investment in capacity development in lightning detection and early warning. So we need to find some funding to develop a Caribbean lightning detection network. And we're also exhorting our researchers and other stakeholders to develop partnerships to enhance our understanding of lightning through research and also to apply it for the saving of lives. Acknowledging also wonderful thanks to the generous support received from the WMO office in Costa Rica and from my colleagues in the US National Lightning Safety Council, in particular Ron Holly and Dr. Marianne Cooper and Kim Lohr and John Jensenius and all the presenters at the symposium and my own staff at the headquarters unit. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Arlene, for this presentation. I think you have uh, showed several of the dimensions that we need to take in account about lining. Is uh, also another important aspect that we really need to strengthen in the region in, in, with all the components in, inside, from the detection until the response and the, 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 the prevention measures in, in, in the countries. So I'd say thank you very much to, to show all the these efforts to really promote the need to work more in cooperation and put more emphasis in terms of the meteorological services and how to enhance the capabilities for lightning detection and of course all the all the interaction with the risk management and the response agencies. Thank you. And I would like to continue uh, and invite Mrs. Berta Olmedo is our next speaker. She is the executive secretary of the a regional committee of hydraulic resources in Central America, eh, el CRRH, Comité Regional de Recursos Hidráulicos. She has a, a degree in applied meteorology at the University of Costa Rica, statistics at the University of Panama, and meteorologist class two certificate from WMO. Mm -hmm. She has been teacher of the meteorological school of the University of Panama since 19, 1996, has been consultant for several international organizations, is a climatology department, department manager uh, in the directorate of ETESA, the Med Service of Panama, and she has been the permanent representative of Panama with the World Meteorological Organization in 2010 to 2012, mm -hmm. and permanent member of the Climate Forum of Central America since 2000 until, until 2015. She will present the Central American Network online in detections, lessons learned, and, and challenges. Eh, Berta, bienvenida. Adelante con tu presentación. Bien, muchísimas gracias eh, por la presentación. Voy a eh, hablarles eh, sobre 
la red centroamericana de descargas eléctricas. Eh, veo con mucha satisfacción el tema que estaba presentando la oradora anterior de que pueden ser redes complementarias a nivel de la Asociación 4 de la Organización Meteorológica Mundial. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, eh, presentar al CRRH. Esta es una eh, institución de la cual forman parte los servicios meteorológicos e hidrológicos de la región centroamericana, ¿verdad? Y esta organización a su vez forma parte de un engranaje regional denominado Sistema de la Integración Centroamericana que nos permite eh, trabajar y coordinar acciones desde el punto de vista regional. Son parte de nuestra organización los servicios meteorológicos desde Belice hasta Panamá. La Red Centroamericana de Descargas Eléctricas es un proyecto que surgió eh, con fondos del proyecto Euroclima Plus. Eh, fueron gestionados por AECIP y los beneficiarios son los servicios meteorológicos e hidrológicos de la región centroamericana. Y el objetivo de la misma pues, es tener, contar con una red para la vigilancia y seguimiento de las tormentas a nivel regional y que también parte del objetivo era mejorar la infraestructura que ya tenían los países en cuanto al monitoreo de las descargas. Esta infraestructura eh, o este proyecto hizo un análisis de la red existente en cada uno de los países o de los sensores existentes en cada uno de los países y cómo, eh, qué se necesitaba, cuántos sensores necesitaba cada país para poder mejorar la detección de las descargas eléctricas en Centroamérica. De esto surgió la siguiente, el siguiente número de sensores. Para Guatemala eh, se instalaron cinco nuevos sensores y un sistema de explotación para el Observatorio Ambiental del Ministerio de Ambiente de El Salvador. Se instalaron dos sensores también con un sistema de explotación en el caso de Senado Copeco, por tener una red ya eh, nacional que creo que consta de cinco sensores, entonces, hubo que agregarle un sensor más y un sistema de explotación para mejorar la triangulación a nivel regional. En el caso de Nicaragua, eh, a través de INETER, pues eh, el, el proyecto instaló cinco sensores y un sistema de explotación. En el caso de Costa Rica, tres sensores y un sistema de explotación. Y en el caso de Panamá, se instalaron seis sensores, un sistema de explotación. Y también en Panamá está ubicado el sistema de control, análisis y localización que permite eh, la recepción de la información a nivel regional y a través de este sistema de localización o este sistema SCAL, se eh, transfiere o los otros países pueden utilizar la información de descarga eléctrica a través del sistema de explotación. O sea, el sistema de descargas eléctricas cuenta de los sensores, de los sistemas de, de los sistemas de explotación, que son seis, uno en cada país, y de un sistema de control, análisis y localización que está ubicado en Panamá. Y en total, el proyecto eh, donó a la región centroamericana 25 sensores, los cuales, como eh, comentaba, pues están unidos a los sensores ya existentes de las redes nacionales. Es decir, que con este proyecto regional se mejora la detección de las descargas eléctricas utilizando las redes nacionales y agregando estos sensores de la red centroamericana. Para la gobernanza de esta red, pues la región centroamericana cuenta con el Consejo Director del Comité Regional de Recursos Hidráulicos, del cual forman parte todos los directores de los servicios que forman parte de la red, eh, una secretaría ejecutiva, que en estos momentos esa designación recae sobre mi persona, pero la secretaría ejecutiva tiene como mandato o como misión ejecutar las eh, instrucciones del consejo director. También tenemos un grupo técnico regional que es aportado por los servicios meteorológicos e hidrológicos y que están en constante coordinación 
con la Secretaría y con los, el, el equipo extrarregional del proyecto, que es el equipo español más eh, la coordinación que tenemos en estos momentos todavía con la empresa que hizo la instalación eh, de los sensores en la región centroamericana. Eh, esta es una imagen de eh, lo, la información original que nos daban los sensores, nos ponían en colores las, las descargas eléctricas dependiendo del tiempo en que había transcurrido de la misma. Este proyecto eh, tuvo eh, o fue beneficiario de pasar a formar parte de otro proyecto regional de gran importancia para los países de la región centroamericana, como lo es el proyecto del Centro Virtual para el Monitoreo del Tiempo Atmosférico Severo. El proyecto de descarga pasó como un elemento más de este centro virtual y aquí eh, al pasar al centro regional se le hicieron algunas adecuaciones para poder monitorear de mejor forma las descargas eléctricas. Como pueden observar aquí, esta es la viñeta, eh, la vista que podemos tener del centro virtual. Aquí tenemos las descargas, eh, aquí está una escala de colores que nos dice el tiempo de ocurrencia, pero tiene un puntito negro, aquí las descargas, no sé si lo pueden apreciar, y justamente ese punto nos indica... Eh, cuáles descargas están cayendo a tierra. O sea, tenemos descargas de nube a tierra, ¿verdad? Que hay algunos puntos negros. Eh, también como parte de este proyecto se hizo una adecuación por núcleos de tormenta y como pueden observar aquí, esta es una imagen, pero en vivo en el, en el sistema se observa cómo parpadean eh, las descargas eléctricas y lo que tenemos aquí en este núcleo identificado en amarillo es la, el acumulado de 15 descargas o más que hayan caído a tierra, ¿verdad? 15 descargas o más de las cuales por lo menos 3 hayan caído a tierra. Entonces, esto nos permite darle un mejor seguimiento al tema de las descargas eléctricas y a su densidad. Acá podemos ver que el sistema de descargas eléctricas original ya montado sobre un mapa de imágenes satelitales con la geola, eh, georreferenciación de las descargas y también podemos observar otro elemento aquí que se ve un poco en morado que es el mapa de calor que también nos indica la densidad de rayos verdad de los últimos 60 minutos. Entonces, podemos diferenciar eh, cuáles son los rayos actuales, cuál es la densidad de ellos, podemos diferenciar en este sistema también eh, cuáles son las descargas que han, que han tenido un impacto a tierra y también las podemos observar sobre el sistema de imágenes satelitales, lo que nos permite eh, puntualizar y darle seguimiento a esas tormentas dentro del propio sistema de imágenes de satélite. También permite este eh, centro virtual poder montar sobre esta misma imagen y colocar también las descargas eléctricas con el mapa base de estaciones meteorológicas, de eh, seguimiento a los ciclones tropicales, como vemos aquí, que es una imagen vieja, se estaba seguimiento, eh, dando seguimiento a un sistema que podría desarrollar en, en depresión, en tormenta tropical, y está montado, como ustedes pueden ver aquí, aquí seguimos con las descargas, imágenes satelitales y seguimiento a ciclones tropicales. Eh, esto, eh, las lecciones aprendidas de esto es que el trabajo como región ha potenciado las aplicaciones del sistema de descarga eléctrica eh, que tenían cada uno de los países, lo que ha hecho más eficiente el uso de los recursos, ya que en lugar de contar con seis sistemas de control, análisis y localización, tenemos un solo sistema de análisis y localización, un sistema regional, 
que permite pues, que todos los otros países puedan tener su sistema de explotación y tener la misma información. Esto hace muy eficiente el uso de los recursos. También tenemos eh, como parte de este proyecto un equipo centroamericano eh, que trabaja en la región y que coordina las actividades en cuanto al sistema de descargas eléctricas. También tenemos el hecho de que la combinación de los resultados de dos proyectos, como es el proyecto de descargas eléctricas, que fue un proyecto en principio eh, pensado para, para quedar allí, cómo esa herramienta pasó a formar parte de otra herramienta de, de también eh, realizada con fondos de Euroclima Plus y que ya el, el sistema de descarga está... Eh, eh, integrado con todos los otros elementos que utilizan los pronosticadores del tiempo para eh, seguir eh, los sistemas eh, meteorológicos que puedan estar generando impactos en la región centroamericana. Y otro de los grandes lecciones aprendidas que vemos de esto es que tenemos la posibilidad ahora de integrar a nuevos actores para generarle servicios utilizando los resultados o la información del sistema de descarga y que también la región del sistema centroamericano, que es un organismo regional que tiene gobernanza, como comentaba al principio, a los más altos niveles y que esta estructura regional nos permite promover apoyos eh, para todos eh, los los organismos que forman parte del sistema y que se pueden ver beneficiados con esta información, como es el organismo regional que coordina el, el tema de electricidad a nivel centroamericano, el organismo regional que trabaja con el sistema de aviación a sistema en Centroamérica, como es con el organismo centroamericano de salud y muchos otros a los cuales, para los cuales esta información pueda ser de relevancia. Eh, en cuanto a los desafíos, pues continuar generando, eh, eh, continuar con el mantenimiento de este sistema de tal manera de que al, eh, al un sensor perder eh, la posibilidad de estar funcionando dentro de todo el gran sistema, pues tenemos el hecho de que eh, esa actividad va a recaer en los países para poder de inmediato darle mantenimiento, pero sigue siendo un desafío poder seguir contando con los recursos para que este sistema se pueda mantener totalmente activo y que muy probablemente podamos ir agregando otros sistemas al mismo. Innovar con nuevos productos, como ya lo decía, y que realmente este sistema regional de descargas o este sistema centroamericano ha contribuido a fortalecer la imagen y a fortalecer a los servicios meteorológicos en cuanto a la prestación de servicios y al seguimiento de las tormentas eléctricas en la región centroamericana. Era todo lo que tenía para presentar. Muchísimas gracias y quedo atenta a cualquier consulta. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Berta, por tu presentación y por compartir este muy buen ejemplo de cooperación regional que se está llevando a cabo en la región centroamericana. Y estoy seguro que de la parte de la audiencia habrá preguntas y por sobre todo que eh, es un ejemplo de que se puede seguir avanzando en la cooperación internacional tan necesaria para enfrentar retos cada vez más complejos. Muchas gracias. Eh, no, eh, I would like to continue with our, our last speaker in, in this morning, Dr. Osvaldo Moraes. Uh, he's the director of the National Center of, for Monitoring and Early Warning of Natural Disasters, SEMADEN, in Brazil. Uh, he's graduated and doctorate in physics from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. His field of expertise is atmospheric sciences. Full professor at Federal University in Brazil in the physics department. He's the chair of the Standing Committee for Disaster Risk Reduction from World Meteorological Organization and lead of the project data of decision making for America and the Caribbean from UNDRR. From 2011-2013, he was head of the Brazilian National Weather Forecast and Climatic Studies, CPTEC, and he was the director for research and development policy and programs 
of the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation of the Brazil, and Scientific Director of the Brazilian Meteorological Society from 2012 to 2015. He will present about the cataloging lining as natural hazard, what is the view of WMO. Osvaldo, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, as the only one in this section that uh, do not have English or Spanish uh, as the first language, I can choose one of them to, uh, and the, with the, all the limitations, but uh, I assume that the majority of the audience is uh, speaking Spanish. I will choose the Portuñol to, to speak. Uh, well, uh, Osvaldo, eh, 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 por favor, si puedes poner en modo de presentación. Eh, la, tu presentación está... Eh, eh, en, la, en la parte de abajo, en la parte de abajo. Eh, exacto, ¿dónde está? Exacto. Es ok. Ok, ok. Uh, ah. Muchas gracias. Oh. Ok. Eh, no, vol no, volvió a cambiar su, su modo. El, Ah, uh, sí, 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 sí. Yo no sé qué está aconteciendo. Bueno, para, para no perder mucho, mucho tiempo, voy a continuar así porque tenemos mucho poco tiempo para hablar. Uh, bueno, yo hablaré uh, brevemente sobre el programa de la OMM para reducción de riesgo de desastres y cómo el problema de los rayos están conectados con el programa. Uh, el programa de reducción de riesgo de la OMM, ayuda a los miembros a desarrollar servicios dirigidos a proteger vidas, medios de subsistencia y propiedades frente a amenazas naturales. Uh, la OMM uh, empezó a prestar atención uh, a a reducción de riesgo de desastre en el Congreso de 2011 y hasta, y hasta el décimo, uh, décimo séptimo Congreso en 2015 se llevó a cabo muchas acciones e iniciativas. Otro marco significativo fue el documento de Disaster Risk Reduction Roadmap publicado en 2017 uh, y finalmente Consideremos con más detalle la continuación fueron las resoluciones del Congreso de 2019. Bueno, otra cosa importante es cómo la reducción de riesgo de desastre, el programa de reducción de riesgo de desastres de la OMM, se ubica con el marco de Sendai. El programa de la de reducción de riesgo Uh, ha destacado la contribución de los servicios meteorológicos nacionales, servicios meteorológicos e hidrológicos nacionales, con una serie de temáticas como evaluación de las amenazas, prevención y mitigación, preparación, especialmente a través de sistemas de alerta en planos, planificación y respuesta militaria, financiamiento de riesgo. Sin embargo, el roadmap de la OMM se vincula explícitamente con las cuatro prioridades uh, de marco de Sendai. E identifica cómo los servicios de la OMM están o estarán en un futuro contribuyendo a la implementación de cada una de estas prioridades. Bueno, otra, la reforma de la uh, Organización Meteorológica Mundial aprobada en el último Congreso uh, establece que el principio de funcionamiento está dividido en do, dos nuevas comisiones, la Comisión de Infraestructura y la Comisión de Servicios. 
y en una junta de investigación. La Comisión de Servicios uh, contribuye al desarrollo de la implementación de servicios de aplicaciones relacionadas con el tiempo, el clima, el agua, el océano y el medio ambiente. Bajo de la Comisión de Servicios, hay seis comités permanentes y tres grupos de estudios. Un de esos comités es el Comité Permanente para la Reducción de Riesgo de Desastres. Y bajo de este comité está seis grupos de expertos. Uh, importante notar que el término de referencia para este comité se establece en cuatro propósitos. Elaboración y mantenimiento de material normativo de la OIM. <coughs> Asistencia a los miembros para mejorar, mejorar su capacidad de prestación de servicios y permitir la aplicación y cumplimiento efectivos. Contribución a la, a contribución a la cadena de valor ciencia, infraestructura y servicios. Y otro también muy importante que es cooperación y asociaciones con parceros externos que sean necesarios para apoyar todos los miembros en estrecha colaboración con las, las asociaciones regionales. Uh, bueno, es importante que el término de referencia del Comité Permanente para el Comité Permanente de Reducción de Riesgo Tienes 14 resultados esperados. Mas, mas algunos de esos resultados están directamente ubicados con las resoluciones del Congreso, del último Congreso. Eh, yo no voy a hablar en, de, hablar en detalles aquí sobre esto, mas es importante notar que una de importante una importante decisión es la catalogación de los eventos extremos. Uh, es importante señalar que la necesidad de estandizar la terminología de desastres es muy clara en marco de Sendai. Y hasta poco tiempo había no muy claro la, la, la cuestión de la terminología. Uh, bueno, después de mucha discusión con muchos, la Oficina de las Naciones Unidas para la Reducción de Riesgo de Desastres y el Consejo Científico Internacional establecieron conjuntamente un grupo de trabajo técnico para identificar el alcance de todas las amenazas relevantes para el marco de Sendai. Y más importante aún es la definición de esas amenazas. Los, las amenazas de origen meteorológica e hidrológica fueron divididas en 10 clústeres, que tienen un total de 60 amenazas. Cada una de esas amenazas se define claramente en una publicación adicional al informe que fue lanzado muy recientemente. La amenaza de lightning, la amenaza de rayos, está incluida en el clúster de amenazas relacionadas a tormentas convectivas, adoptó la definición propuesta por de la OMM en 2017. Bueno, esta transparencia ya fue, esta, uh, ya fue mostrada anteriormente, de, de modo que voy a uh, escapar y voy a mostrar ahora muy brevemente algunas aplicaciones que 
considero importante do ponto de vista de, de, uh, de como se pode usar a informação de, 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 de lightning, de raios, para alertas tempranos. Uh, bueno, uh, este slide acá te muestra un ejemplo de, o, de inundaciones, eh, inundaciones bruscas en Brasil. ¿Y cómo podemos usar la información de, 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 de rayos para hacer alertas tempranos? En este dispositivo presento e uh, um exemplo de inundação que aconteceu em la cidade de São Paulo em 12 de março de 2018. Uh, usamos a rede de, de, de detecção de superfície uh, e para fazer o alerta temprano. Você pode ver aqui que há um grande intensidade de la quantidade de la de los de los raios intra nuvens antes de la tormenta em que a empezar e, e las, estas linhas uh, azuis acá se mostra em momento que la que la uh, inundações começa em la cidade de São Paulo e que foi detectada pela defesa civil então, fazendo uma associação entre a intensidade das de descargas atmosféricas entre nuvens, se pode antecipar os eventos de inundações com uns 30 ou 40 minutos antes de as inundações serem observadas. Então, é importante considerar que a uh, que uh, Lightning é um hazard. Entretanto, o uso da ciência pode fazer uso destas informações num sistema de alerta temprano. E eu, então, considerando o tempo, vou uh, parar aqui e estou à disposição para questões que possam aparecer. Muito obrigado. Muchas gracias, Osvaldo, eh, por tu presentación y por compartirnos la perspectiva de lo que significa pa, eh, el tema del lightning, de descargas eléctricas, rayos para la, la OMM. Y bueno, estamos ya al final de la sesión y a mí me gusta. Eh, I would like to invite to eh, Dr. Roger Puarte from NOAA to say some words eh, regarding to all this, this, this session. Ana. After that, respond some questions that we have from the audience. Roger, welcome. Thank you very much, Rodney, and my apologies for the double booking. So we heard some very, very rich uh, stories here. I, I was very much pleased to see Oswaldo talk about the cascading hazard between lightning and flood. And this issue is becoming a bigger issue for urban environments for water treatment after wildfires. So in keeping this in mind, uh, um, what uh, Dr. Lang, Alin Lang was talking about on convective available potential energy. We're seeing changes in that in clouds, creating more and more dry thunderstorms. In 2018, California, the state in the US, had 1.8 million um, uh, hectares burned. In 2020, they had 2.8. And the driver of the 2020 record, which was four times the previous uh, record, was 11,000 lightning strikes that drove this in one week. The full season usually gets 15,000, and in one week they got 11,000. So as we see these practices, the changing nature of the risks of cascading hazards, as you heard from uh, Oswaldo, the, the, the antecedents that can tell you about lightning and about um, flooding, there are some critical issues from a systemic risk standpoint. When the wildfires in California happened, 40% of the impact happened outside of the state because of water quality. 
because of supply chains. And so we need to think in terms of the complex aspects of these risks. Most critically, I think Berta raised a very, very important point um, about the need for regional coordination and broadening the actor network. And as we talk about in the regional assessment report, the issue of sustaining those networks are key. And as part of financing uh, Sendai, uh, climate adaptation, the SDGs, we need to keep in mind where those mechanisms are being funded and to supported in terms of maintaining the regional network, such as what Berta, um, Berta talked about. So that chain that Osvaldo talked about, about science, infrastructure, and services is supported. In the case of lightning, I think it has been an underappreciated hazard. And this session actually really brings us to something that triggers complex risks in ways that we actually um, didn't fully appreciate. I mean, we see floods, we see drought, and yet so much happens from the moment we see lightning strikes and wildfires. I can say a whole lot more about that in the work we, we do with Oswaldo and others and activities in you know, the Grand Chaco and Pantanal and so on. But this link of sustaining the regional network as key to informing responses to systemic risk is extremely critical. And um, Rodney, thank you for all the work in pulling this together, but I think this is an extremely rich and new entry point uh, as a terrain. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Roger, and nice to see you too. And uh, thank you very much for this productive session. We are out of time now, but uh, I just would like to um, inform that we have uh, the participation of seven uh, 67 uh, participants from um, from uh, uh, representing all the subregions in Americas and the Caribbean, and uh, in the times when these platforms were face-to-face -face meetings, remember these those times when we have uh, several uh, simultaneous side events. To have an audience of uh, 67 when we are now competing with other sessions is is, is remarkable. So it's good. It could mean a, a, a full room in, 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 in a venue of the, of the platform in other times. We hope to, to be able to meet again face to face, but at this time, I think this is a good audience for this particular issue. So, uh, and there are many opportunities ahead from that we li have listened today. That we definitely need to foster our cooperation in terms of wildfires to share knowledge between the region because there are strong knowledge, there are strong good practices. Good, uh, lessons learned, uh, strong lessons learned also, very difficult lessons learned that we need to share and promote the cooperation in, about wildfires. And this is something that, that will imply training, workshops, more specific workshops to foster this dialogue and this uh, exchange of knowledge. And in terms of lightning, as, as, as Roy said, and as Waldo mentioned, this is, is under, under I, I think, it, the importance of lightning should be really increased and we need to work on that. This is one of the motivations for to have a line in here in this session. It's a new theme that we need to really foster to be more visible because it takes a lot of lives and damages every year. So thank you very much to all. Thank you very much to all, all our speakers to share your knowledge, your speech, your time with us, because this is what it matters here in this platform, is to share what we know in the, on the benefit of all the region. All, all, all the practitioners, all the people who's working here and needs to learn more to, to really save lives and, and foster development. And thank you very much to all for, for your patience and, and, and the speaker, the, the interpreters and all the support team that was behind the scenes. Thank you very much and have a, a good rest of the day. Thank you.